Good morning, everybody. We will get started here in about two minutes so we get everybody in the call. Good morning, everybody. We started here about a minute and a half. Make sure everybody gets dialed in. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in one minute. One minute and counting. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started here in 30 seconds. 30 seconds to get started. Got a few more people dialing in. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Everybody else will have to catch up. So you've heard me talk about this before, but we, I cannot say it enough. Have they, has there been studies, have there been studies that have shown that unleaked lucky people within six to eight weeks can become lucky? Has there been studies by major, major universities here in England and in the U.S. that have talked about luck? Yes, you're right, Nick. Yes. So, Yes, Dale. So what then, what makes luck? What's it come down to? Ah, Nick's got it. The more people you know, that's right. Positive attitude and connections. And of the two, connections is by far the main, the main um, thing you need to do. Now, if you have a positive attitude, that's going to allow you to have more connections and also make more connections want to stay connected to you. But the more connections you have, the more connections you have, the luckier you are going to get. The more people you know, the more people you interact with, the more likely somebody's going to call you and say, hey, I've got tickets to the, the uh, playoff game. I can't go. Do you want to go? The more likely it is that if your son needs a job, that, the, that when you reach out, they're going to say, I can get him into that company and get, a, get an interview for him. See, the lucky – and that's luck. Because everybody else is, oh, boy, that, that – <laughs> You're lucky that your dad got you in there. Oh, you're lucky that you got those tickets. No, if you had not had those connections, guess what? That would not have happened. So the more connections you have, the better. So what are different ways that you could get connections? Well, one of them is a lead club. And it's been a while since we've talked about this, but guys, our accountants, are many accountants looking for uh, new clients, especially high net worth or business clients? How about attorneys? Are they looking for clients? How about Property cash agents, are they looking for clients? How about health insurance people? Are they looking for clients? They're all looking for clients. You're looking for clients. So why not form a lead club, find an accountant, an attorney, a health insurance agent, and a, and a um, uh, property cash agent, and form a lead club. Just have lunch. Just have lunch once a month. You can, it doesn't take much for you to organize that. Heck, you could even pay for it. That, that'll get them there. And then at those lunches, you do what? Discuss, everybody brings at least one person that they can uh, refer to somebody else in the group. Heck, uh, put together a presentation that you could all invite your clients to that would talk about uh, estate planning, that would talk about, uh, you know, guys, are people concerned today about property casualty costs? Are people concerned about property casualty costs? Why are in? Why are in? Are they different than they were five years ago? Yeah, why are in? Are they concerned about property casualty? Their home insurance, 
in their car insurance. What's happening to those rates? They're skyrocketing. Do you think people would attend something where a property casualty expert was going to be talking about property, uh, how to reduce or shop for the best property casualty? Yes, they would. I mean, are there things in the news about a uh, estate plan? I mean, there are things, guys, this costs you very, very little. It's the mailing cost that, and the marketing cost that get cost so much. When you have a lead club, those costs are minimal, minimal, minimal. So that's a way to get to know more people, have more connections. Because if you had a, an accountant, an attorney, a uh, uh, property cash the agent, and, and a, a, uh, an account, or what did I say that? Oh, and a health insurance agent. You've got all of their clients. You've got 100, 100, 100, that's 400 new people. You didn't, and, and I'm being modest here in the 100, 100, 100, 100. That's 400 new people. You otherwise would not have had a chance. Make sense? Mark says, I uh, just had a virtual law firm call yesterday uh, um, called the Stately that would love to uh, share with this. Oh, I see. Well, maybe, uh, Mark, but uh, talk to Jerry about that, and he, he can let you know whether that would make sense or not. Okay, so that's a way to, to um, uh, have uh, get uh, people that you at people that you otherwise would not have gotten at at a very inexpensive way. Now today, though, the main topic I want to talk about is is sales tips. How can we become better salespeople? And as we talked about last week, the top advisors out there are they awesome analysts? Are they awesome stock pickers? Or are they the best salespeople? Who's the most successful? The awesome stock picker, the awesome analyst, or the best salespeople? The best salespeople are. I mean, some of the most successful people in my town are people who are, are not the brightest <laughs> people in the world, but people love them. And that's okay because you don't have to be that bright when it comes to the stock market. You need to be bright when it comes to how to connect with people, how to make friends with people how to get them to trust you. That's what you need to be great at. You're not being paid to analyze stocks. And as I said last week, the people who are best at stock picking, they failed in this industry. Sure, they're great. Well, they're great in their basement because nobody wants to work with them. They don't know how to, to connect with people or communicate with people. So we want to talk about the top sales uh, uh, tips. And where do we get these tips? From 500 of the best salespeople in the country as uh, as um, Related by HubSpot. You've heard me talk about HubSpot. I love HubSpot for marketing. I love them for technology. I love them for sales tips. They are a fantastic website to get information from. You do, if you don't uh, subscribe to their newsletter, you, which is free, yada. So, but this is this is an article I had about 500 tips from the best salespeople in the country. So, first tip: stop and ask first. And we, we where do we do this? I'll give you an example of that. The, our very first meeting. We do what? Would you mind if I shared with you what happens the next hour or so? So what does that do? What does that one question do? Because when they come in, they're nervous as heck, right? They're like, oh, this guy's going to try to sell me something. Oh, this guy's going to try to get my money. Oh, this guy's going to... When you say, would it be okay if I share with you what happens the next hour or so, they say, oh, geez, he's asking my permission. Nothing's going to happen with my permi without my permission. What happens to the resistance level? They're angst when you ask that question. Would it be okay if I share with you what happened in the or so? Their, their, their anxiety goes down. What else does it do? They're saying, oh, I don't have to give any information that I don't want to. Giving them permission to say no. What happens to their anxiety and their angst? It goes down. What happens to they're thinking, oh, I wonder what's going to happen to me and what he's going to try to do? It's, it says, oh, I don't need to worry wonder about that because he's just about to tell me. What happens to their anxiety? What happens to their angst? It goes down. See, the first question we ask them in the first minute of the first meeting, what happens to their fight flight syndrome, their pulse rate, their anxiety? It goes down. So asking permission first, ask, and we do this throughout the meeting, throughout the scripts. Follow the scripts, and you can see where we use it over and over and over. But that's just one example of it. So Yes, we use this tip <laughs> because it helps uh, let people know nothing's going to happen without their permission. Does that make sense? Never assume. Never assume. Never assume they know something. Never assume that they came in. And this is the biggest one. I, when, 
people first come on to 5Q, uh, they make the assumption that somebody responds to your marketing. If somebody comes into your office, that the reason they're coming in is because they want help, that they're looking for help, that they're looking to move their money. If that's the case, guys, yes or no. If somebody comes into your office, again, occasionally it happens, but nine times out of ten, when somebody comes to your office, are they coming in with the purpose of finding a new advisor to move their money? Yay or nay? Yay or nay? Y or N? No! They're coming in for one of two reasons. One is to get their questions answered. And once you answer those questions, nine times out of ten, they're going to do what? Take them back to their current guy. Why would they take them back to their current guy when you're the one that gave them the great idea? Because do people like hassle? No. Do people like confrontation? No. And leaving their current advisor is that confrontational. Even if the guy's nice about it, it's confrontational. Why? Because they have to tell their, their, their guy that, I no longer trust you. I no longer want you to be handing me money. I'm choosing somebody else. That's difficult for people to do. People do not like confrontation. And is it a hassle to move from one advisor to another advisor? Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Because they're anxious about, geez, is the money going to move? How fast is it going to move? Where's it going to move? Or do I really know what's going on? Do I, how much do I know about? Yes. So they're gonna, if they're going to take your answers, and they're going to go back to the current guy. Not that they don't think you don't have good ideas. They just want to give those ideas to the current guy. That's one thing. Uh, that uh, the reason they do it. The second reason they do it is they want to be told how great they're doing. They want to show off how well they plan for retirement. So don't assume when somebody comes in that they're, they're they are um, playing them with the money. Here's another big one. And these are some of the saddest stories I have from advisors. Huge client referred to them. Huge client referred to them. So guess what they skip? What do you think they skip? Give me some answers here. The huge client referred to them from one of their best clients. So what do they skip? If they're referred to them because they're, they, they want to know what they should do with their the 401k. They want to know what to do with their inheritance. So they've been referred to them by one of your best clients. And what do you think the, the advisor does? What does he skip? Somebody, somebody put that in there. What do you think they skip? Somebody. They skip the 21-point checklist. Let's get, why would I need to do the 21-point checklist? Why would, I, why, why would I need to do that? Because, you know, they're already coming to me. They've already been referred to me. I don't need to do that. That's a lot of work. That's a lot of effort. Well, if they're coming in and want to know what to do with the money, you know what I'm an expert at? What to do with the money. So they just jump in and they start telling them what to do with their money. No, 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 no. Because guess what? Do you think you truly, you're the only person they're asking? Yeah, they referred in. Yes, they're talking to you, but if they just received an inheritance, wondering what to do with their 401k, do you really think you're the only person that they're talking to? No. you got a chance to talk to them because you referred in, but that doesn't mean you're exclusively the only person they're talking to. Now, here's a question for you. Give me yeas or nays on this. Do our competitors lie or, shall we say, overly exaggerate what they can accomplish? Do our competitors overly exaggerate what they can accomplish? Of course they do. Of course they do. So if you say you can make somebody five, what's your competitor saying? Six. If you say you can make them six, guess what your competitor is saying? Seven. So you can't rely on, on a, uh, the fact that they're a, a, a referral and do something different. If they do a referral, you take them through the same exact process. You do the first meeting. You do the 21-point checklist. You do the implementation meeting. That's how you're getting, and here's the question. Let's say that they were, let's just assume that, you know, we'll make a assume, we'll make an ass out of me and, and them. So let's, let, let's assume that they would have moved money because I was the only person to talk to. Do you really think, do you really think that that would squirrel the deal by doing a 21 point checklist? No, so worst case scenario, they're gonna be happy to do a 21 point checklist. You didn't need to, but you did one anyways, which you should be doing anyways. Or <laughs> uh, best case is you do a 21-point checklist, and they were shopping around, and you made the other guy look like a salesman where you look like an advisor. Does that make sense? So don't assume anything. Follow the process. Things I know, things I don't know, things I don't I know I don't know. So guys. Many of us think we know a lot more than we do. 
Many of us think, so there's a couple ways to fix that. First, always be learning. Second, always be looking at contrarian views. Always be looking at contrarian views. And make sure you understand the client. And what's the best way to understand the client? Make sure you're asking questions. Make sure you're asking questions. Okay? Always have a sales funnel running. The most frustrating thing that, uh, that I hear from guys is when they'll tell me, oh, you know what, I'm out of people to see. I don't know who to see. I, my, my client base is aging out, and, I, and I, don't, I haven't marketed for years. Guys, you should be marketing continually. You should be marketing continually. Maybe you shouldn't be spending money, but we just talked about one way that you could market without spending money, right? Using the lead club. What are some other ways? Well, let me get in here. I'm gonna, we've got all of these. Again, choose the unique selling proposition that you love. And we've got all of these systems here that cost nothing. Now, should you do all of them? No, 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 don't do all of them. Find one, then add another one, and then add another one. Have three of these running at one time. And I will tell you that one of my most successful marketers spent no money on marketing, well, no money, relatively low, probably less than five grand a year on marketing. What's that like? Five, uh, 500 bucks a month on marketing. And he had, he had people coming in every single week. How many of you have new people coming in every single week? So that's four people for $500. That's, that's about a, what, 125, $125 per person to come in and see him. The, and, he, and I will tell you that his marketing sucked. His marketing sucked. So why, why am I saying he's the most successful marketer I've ever seen? He only spent $500 a month was getting four new people a, a, a week on average, four new people a month, about one a week, and I'm saying his marketing sucks. Why am I saying that? Anybody know? Anybody know why I'd be saying that? Because he actually was running four of these, <clears throat> four of these, no or low cost. And guys, if they're no or low cost, do they work fantastic, or do they kind of limp through? Are they are they fantastic or are they limpy? If, if they're no cost or low cost. I think they're fantastic or they kind of limp, limp along. They limp along. But by doing four of these, that's right, Mark, they limp along. But by doing four of these at a time, guess what? All of these kind of sucky, <laughs> no cost or low cost marketing schemes worked together. And they started to, he had a, a, a and that's the nice thing about these no or low cost is they also are, are things that happen, once you get it set up, they're super, super easy to do. Does that make sense? So always have leads, a uh, lead generation funnel moving, uh, so you have people, new people moving through your customers. Even if you have the most successful practice in the world, you need to be doing that. Uh, that's, yeah, I agree, Mark. Mark says, I need 100 ways to re get one client not one way to get a hundred. That's perfectly said, Mark. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I need a hundred ways that each get one client, not one way to get a hundred clients. I totally, totally agree with that. Because if you, what, why, why is Mark, why am I so excited about what Mark just says there? I'd rather have a hundred ways to get one client than one way to get a hundred clients. Because if, it, does every marketing, I don't care if it's the best seminar out there, I don't care if it's a radio show, I don't care, whatever, um, a mailing, it works until it was. It doesn't work. And if, you, if you're relying on just one marketing system and it fails, you're then screwed. But by having 100, and again, he's exaggerating, I'm exaggerating, you don't have 100. I'm saying four of these, four of those low or low, low cost running at the same time are going to get you plenty, plenty, plenty of new clients if you follow the system. Because that, that system is also going to get you referrals. Make sense? I am too positive. I, uh, I'm too positive to be doubtful, too optimistic to be fearful, and way too determined to be defeated. So, guys, this is this is one of the most important things that we can do to be successful. Not just in our business, but any business. Share it with your children, your friends, your relatives, and most importantly, with yourself. All the studies have been done on billionaires not millionaires, but billionaires. All of a sudden, done billionaires found out they had one characteristic in common. What was that characteristic?
what was that one characteristic? All billionaires. I mean, 100%, not most. All billionaires shared. What was the one characteristic? They had failed. They had failed at the business before they succeeded. Now, when they failed, let's say it was uh, maybe they're, uh, let's just use dry cleaning. They're dry cleaning. So they become ultra, ultra, ultra successful at a dry cleaning business. Now they have dry cleaners throughout the country and they're a billionaire. They, they failed earlier, not trying to run a restaurant, not trying to run a car, uh, car repair service. No, they failed at dry cleaning. So the trick to being successful is failing at what you're trying to do, learning from that, and trying the same thing again with the things that you learn. So you guys have put too much time, effort into being an advisor, <laughs> trying to open a dry cleaning service. So what you should do is to be successful as an advisor is every failure that you have, don't whine, don't cry, don't gnash your teeth, or maybe do it for a half an hour, but then pick yourself up by your big boy or your big girl pants, and then say, what did I learn from this? What shouldn't I do next time? And what should I do better next time? This is, that's how you become successful. Walk a day in your client's shoes. In other words, we have to put ourselves in our client's shoes, enter the matrix, this is a very strange and familiar world that our clients inhabit. And we help you do that. How do we help you walk in your client's shoes? How do we help you walk in client's shoes? By using motivational interviews. Do we ever tell, do we ever sell, do we ever preach? Do we ever teach? No, I ask open-ended questions and let them tell me. Another really, really, really important way we do it is if they give us, if we just kind of muffed up and didn't do this, the script as well as we wanted to, and they give us an objection. Because remember, if you do the script, you don't get objections. So let's say it's a bad day or you're still learning and they give you an objection. What's the first thing we do? We say, absolutely. And then I start to tell them why what they just said is absolutely true. I don't care if they say annuity sucks, or they say uh, I should have 100% of my money in the stock market, or they say whatever they say, I'm going to spend three, four minutes telling them why their train of thought is not wrong. I'm not going to say yes, but. No, 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 no. I say here's why what you just said is absolutely right. I walk in their shoes. See, when they give me an objection, they're what? They're thinking he's going to try to overcome that objection. So they, they prepare for battle. The fight flight goes up, pulse rate goes up, blood pressure goes up, rest rate goes up, listening goes down. And when they give me an objection, they're expecting me, or and in fact it does, you, you know me well enough, what happens to my blood, blood pressure, pulse rate, rest rate, goes up, 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 and what happens to my uh, ability to listen goes down, down, down. So the way I fix that is as soon as they give me an objection, I say, absolutely. I take a breath, and then I think in my mind, well, why would they have said that? Why? looking at the world through their eyes, why is that 100% right? And then I start to tell them why they're right. And when I do that, they're like, what? I thought he was going to argue with me. Instead, he's telling me I'm right. That's, I can't believe. Hmm, what's going on here? I better listen to him a little bit more. See, what happens to the fight flight? It goes down. What happens to the ability to listen? It goes up. What happens to them being an ad, uh, uh, adversary on the other side of the table? It goes away. I'm now on their side of the table. And they go, this guy gets me. And when we think that this guy gets me, guess what? We like them. And when we like them, we'll listen to them. So after I'm on their side, walking in their shoes, telling them why the way they view the world is absolutely correct, that after three or four minutes gives me permission to slowly ask, start asking some open-ended questions so they start viewing the world through my eyes, through reality's eyes. Does that make sense? So guys, you see, every one of these tips, do we do every single one of these tips? We do. They're built in. They're cooked. They're baked into the system. <laughs> Don't oversell. Don't oversell and underdeliver. That's going to give you a poor outcome. Don't oversell, underdeliver. That's going to give you a poor outcome. And I told you guys all, 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 when it comes to your money managers, should you be telling them that, oh, I've got this money manager and he's going to get you, might not get you the highest rate of return going forward, but boy, he'll protect you on the downside. Should you, yay or nay, is that a good pitch for your money manager? Is that a good pitch for your money manager? You might not, you know, might not get all the upside, but this guy is excellent at making sure you get the downside. No, that's not because Tom says no. I agree, Tom, because can he guarantee, can you guarantee that? Have there been, have there been funds that are designed to be conservative that have gotten hammered? They've been designed and marketed 
to be conservative, and then they basically got hammered, lost 70 80%. Have there been funds like that? Yes, there have. Would you bet your house, if you're going to tell people that, will you bet your house on that? That if, if you're wrong, if you're wrong, now I'll do it with an FDIC insured CD. I'll do it all day long. I'll bet my house on that. But with a money manager, I sure in the heck ain't going to do that because they all make uh, a mistake. So I, I'm not going to, so am I going to say then, okay, well, if I'm not going to say, well, you might not get all the return, but it's going to check the downside. Am I going to try to convince them that my guy's going to beat the market? Because, well, I bet my house on that guy beating the market. <laughs> no way in heck. So who's got it? Who's been listening to me for, since they've been on the system? What are the three things with my money manager that I promise people? To make sure I don't oversell and I don't underdeliver. I don't oversell. What are the three things that I promise all my clients with my money manager? Come on, guys. You should all know this. What would I bet my house on? There you go. Oh, they have got it. Got it. When the market goes up, you're going to go up. When the market goes down, you're going to go down. But for the last 150 years, the market has gone up much, much more than the market has gone down. So this is where we're going to have our growth money. That's the three. Now, would I bet my house on that? When the market goes up, their account's going to go up. When the market goes down, their account's going to go down. Would I bet my house on this? Yes, I would. So please don't oversell and underdeliver. Instead, underpromise and overdeliver. Divine expectations from the start. Another example, first meeting in the get-go, the expectations are what? I say, I let them know that what? We're going to have solutions at the first meeting or we're not. And we actually combine a lot of these tips into this one little uh, uh, script at the very beginning where we say, you know, I don't want to assume. If I assume what you like and you don't like, that would make an ass out of who? So I'm not, I don't assume what you like and what you don't like. So because I don't, this meeting today is about you to discover more about what you have. And then it's, during this meeting, you're going to tell me what you like. And you're going to tell me what you don't like. And the things that you like, I'm not going to come up with solutions. If, if I tried to come up with solutions for things that you already like, I would consider that me being a salesperson. Because you're already, you're already happy there. Me trying to force some other idea on you, that's silly. That's a salesperson. But once I find out things you don't like, guess what then I will do? I will go back, take that information, and then I will start to find solutions. Because I'll be honest with you. I'm kind of lazy. So the last thing I want to do is a lot of work and then find out that you like all these things. And I say, boy, I did all that work and they don't even need it. So instead, this means about you to discover better what you have now. You to tell me what you like. You to tell me what you don't like. And then once I know that, then I can go back and start getting solutions. So are you looking for a salesperson or are you looking for somebody who takes the things that you're not happy with and finds solutions for that? Well, no, I want somebody who takes things I'm not happy with and finds solutions. Yeah, so in today's meeting, am I going to have a lot of solutions for you? Or is today's meeting more about finding out what you like and what you don't like? No, it's about what you like and don't like. So at the end, am I going to have any solutions for you? No, you're not going to have any. So have we set an expectation that I'm not going to have any solutions at the end of this first meeting? Do you get that? So do you see how all these things are baked in to the process? Sell the problem, you solve, not the product. Guys, if you sell the product, if you sell the product, who else can sell the same product you sell? Who else can sell the exact same product you sell? Their current advisor. And we just talked about they don't like they don't like um hassles. They don't like confrontation. So if you give them a product, a fantastic product, the best product in the world, and even if, it, let's say you even have a product that's proprietary, can their guy find a product that's pretty darn close? And you can talk to Jerry. Jerry does it every single day where somebody comes in and says, there's a proprietary product. And Jerry says, well, yeah, that might be proprietary, but this one over here is basically the same thing. So if you go in with the product, you're going to lose because they're going to stay with the current guy. So here's, guys, please, everybody, I'm not going to be satisfied with one person answering this question. Everybody's going to answer this question. What is the problem they discover at the 21-point checklist? What is the one problem they should discover at the 21-point checklist that will get 100% of people to leave their current advisor and move to the next? Got it. What else? Guys, what's the only problem? There's not 21 problems that everybody's getting. Thank you, guys. They cannot trust their guy. That's the problem. 
That's the problem. And is that a problem that the current advisor can fix? No. Is that a problem where people say, let me think about it? No. Is, this a, is that a problem where people say, when I get back from vacation, I'm going to move the money? No. Is that even a problem when the son is their advisor? No. When they can't trust where they're getting their life savings information from, they are going to move. Again, you can, you, can, you can lead a horse to water, but you cannot make them drink. They have to come to their own conclusion. That's why we use motivational interviewing. When we have a brilliant idea, instead of making, uh, making others think it's ours, why not let them cook and stir the idea themselves? Again, do not tell, do not sell, do not preach, do not teach. Ask open-ended questions so all of these things, guys, if you tell me my wife is cheating on me, what's likely to happen? If you tell me my wife is cheating on me, what's likely to happen? That I'm going to say thank you or we got a fist fight? Thank you or a fist fight? Do, do T-Y for thank you or F-F for a fist fight? Yeah, fight, fight, fight. I'm going to fight. But if I find out, if I discover my wife's cheating, then what? So the place I direct my anger depends on whether you tell me my wife's cheating or I find out for myself that my wife is cheating. The, the, the direction of anger depends on where that comes from. So should we ever tell them their guy is cheating them? No. They have to discover it for themselves. Again, that's why we have, you don't have to do this yourself. We, we've got a script. <laughs> 27 years ago, I predicted what your clients would say, 27, a quarter of a century in the future. And they say it. So you don't even have to, dis, you don't even have to, <laughs> to figure out how to do this. It's been done for you. The scripts work as well in 1997 as they do today, or today as they did in 1997. It's just simple. Be punctual. Don't ever be late, guys. Never plan to be late. Have a high confidence level. Guys, what's the best way to have a high confidence level with the 5Q system? I've, I've talked about this before, and I'm not proud of it. Uh, but back when, before Ubers, back when I was in the Navy, my buddies and I used to drink too much. And guess what we did? We practiced the, the sobriety test, walking the line, alphabet backwards, six sheets to the wind. We practiced that so that if we were ever pulled over, we could walk the line completely drunk, and we could do it the alphabet backwards completely drunk. I know I'm not proud of it, but guess what? We could do those two things, completely inebriated. What? What you should do with the scripts is what? Practice till you get them or practice till you can't get them wrong? Practice till you get them or practice till you can't get them wrong? Practice to, to not till you can get them on your best day. Practice so you can get them even on your worst day. Again, all these tips are worked into the script. They're worked into the process. That will give you a high confidence. Building rapport. How do I build rapport? If you build rapport the Zig Ziglar way, the way many of us were taught, that, hey, you know, you fish, I fish too. Oh, your kid went to U of M, I went to U of M. If you do rapport that way, does that develop rapport with boomers, with millennials, with Gen Z, Gen X? Does that build rapport when you do that with anybody? It did build, it absolutely did build rapport with the greatest generation. They are now gone. We're, they are not our clients anymore. Does that kind of rapport building work with millennials, boomers, Gen Z, Gen X? Does it work with them? No, as soon as you start that stuff, they immediately think what? This is just what? Some kind of sleazy salesman. They don't, so how do we build rapport? Well, first of all, by not telling, selling, preaching, or teaching, instead of asking questions, letting them do all the talking. Also, <laughs> when empowering them, remember that's the most powerful tool we have is empowering them, telling them they're above average, not in general, but about a particular thing. Our whole system is to develop, to develop rapport in the right way. When they give us an objection, we tell them they're right. Talk about developing rapport. Instead of arguing with them like they, they expect, I tell them they're absolutely spot on right. And I go on for three or four minutes on telling them why they're right. That builds rapport. Not trying to, not trying to find things that you have in common. That warns them that you're a salesperson. The greatest glory in living uh, lies not, <laughs> you have to be careful how you read this. The greatest glory in living lies not in never falling, but in rising every time we fall. And we just talked about that. It's very similar to the other one. That when you fail, get up. Again, spend a half an hour crying and whining, then get up 
and do it again. Learn from what happened and do it again. Here's a big one. And again, this is where I talk about Tom all the time because he is my hero. He gets a thousand times more referrals than I ever got. And he gets referrals. Why? Because he does not give up on people. And this is showing typically what happens. A prospect will come in. He, uh, so, uh, and this is not for financial advisors. This is just sales people in general. Contact one. 50% of salespeople have given up. Well, you know what? That's, that's somebody I can't get. They love their advisor. Can't get them. 60, at contact two. 65% of salespeople have given up and they don't get a sale. Contact three. 79% of salespeople have given up. Contact four. You harvest low-hanging fruit. 89, but you, after contact four is when, again, because everybody has a different number of contacts before they'll, they'll, they'll move their money to or become a client. So you are over here. Some people will start to, to uh, the low-hanging fruit, the easy people, and contact four. So first meeting, second, 21-point uh, checklist, implementation meeting, move the money. Oh, you got those low-hanging fruit. But 89% of other people have given up by that point. Contact five, just now you're becoming a factor in your prospect's mind. Nurturing slowly, your prospect gets to know you. You're probably the only person to make eight contacts with this person. Boom, boom, boom. So after 12, you virtually get everybody. So you're earning the top of mind awareness by contact seven. At this point, when your prospect is ready to buy, you have a 90% chance of being called. So how do we maintain these contacts? We made a mistake. We didn't learn the script as soon as we, or as well as we did. We, we assumed because the referral, they're going to become a client. For whatever reason, they don't become a client at contact four. Because really, we're not even getting, with this system, you don't get low-hanging fruit, you get 100% of people. If you do the system right to learn the script, you get 100% here. But let's say we made a mistake. Well, then, what are we doing here? What do we have? What tools do we have that will allow you to contact in five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten times? Do we have a tool that will allow you to do that? What's the, yes, we have the DRIP program, the epidemic uh, uh, program. Where is that on the site? Well, let me, let me show you here. Escape, and we have epidemic marketing, the DRIP. Boom, we do it for you. It costs you nothing, nothing. You can send them one email and one uh, a client prospect newsletter, a helpful checklist, and a, a walk down memory lane. Every single month you're doing that. And remember, what's the number one reason people leave their current advisor? What's the number one pe reason people leave their current advisor? What is it? What's the number one reason? Is it because of a lack of return? Is lack of communication, June. You got it. Lack of communication. So if you're contacting them a couple of times and helpful, not remember, these are not our drip, our, our emails, the walk down memory lane, the checklist, the newsletter. These are not investment driven. And you've heard me say it over and over again. You go on a date with a girl and the only thing you talk about is sex. What does she know about you? You want sex. It's the only thing you talk about investments. What does the prospect know about you? You only want their investments. So our contacts have nothing. Well, they, they are in the ancillary. They are in the outskirts of investments. They're, they're financial. They will help them financially, but it's not about their investments. So if we're contacting them two times, three times a, a month in helpful ways where we're not just harping on them about moving their investments, how often does the current advisor contact them? And, and when they do contact them, what are they always talking about? Money, 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 money. And do our competitors make mistakes? Do our competitors make mistakes? Yes, they do. They, re they forget to return phone calls or, or, or phone them late. Or they never call the, the clients. The clients have to call them. So when the market crashes or there's an interest rate change or there's whatever, and the client's thinking, oh, my gosh, I don't know what, how this affecting me. How's it going to change? They have to call their advisor, and the advisor never calls them. They, the client is forced to be proactive. Is that a mistake? Yes. Uh, do our staff sometimes make mistakes? Yes. They're grumpy on the phone when they call. I mean, you have no control over it, but it happens. So these are, or when the market does fall and you do talk to a client, and you're like, hey, you know, I, I get it. No, the market's down. But remember, we plan for this. That's why we have this. Your, your uh, uh, portfolio is that's the way it is. We just have to take a breath. Just quit watching the market. Quit watching the news. Everything's going to be okay. We plan for this. So just take a breath. I've got, I've got it. I've got you. Don't worry about it. I've got it handled. Guys, is that a mistake? Yay or nay? Everybody answer this. Yay or nay? Why or in? Is that a mistake saying that to your client? I got one right answer. Come on, yay or nay? Why or in? Is that the, is that the appropriate way to answer a client? 
The fact that nobody's answering this tells me that maybe you don't know. Is it, why, is it yes or no? Well, let me ask you a question. Am I walking in my client's shoes at that point? No. I've just told the client what? What have I told the client? What are you worried about? You silly person. I told you we had this handle. Why are you bothering me? What's this call about? Just turn off the news. You're cool. Quit bothering me. Take a breath. Go, go on your That's what that. You are not saying that. Was I saying that in, in my words? No, but it, guess what they hear? They hear that. Is that a mistake? So do our competitors make mistakes? Yes, and when they do, guess what? If you're contacting them on a regular basis, they're finally fed up with a guy, your newsletter just happens to hit that day, they're calling you. Drip, 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 drip. How long would you do that? I told you a couple of weeks ago, Tom will drip on them forever. And he has people from four years ago that will call and say, I know we haven't talked for a long time, but, uh, you know, you've, I've been getting your newsletters. Uh, remember, I don't know if you remember me when we met, but you really impressed me. I'd like, I'm ready to move forward. Four years ago. So how much did Tom spend on that person? Well, you figure maybe a uh, dollar per month, $12, $12, $48, 50 bucks to get a million dollar account. Is that worth it? Heck yeah. So drip, drip, drip on your prospects and on your clients. Overcoming the no, well, we know how to do that, right? First thing we say is absolutely, tell them why they're right, and then we ask open-ended questions. Open-ended questions. Again, we have the formula to do this. We, there is no objection. Overcoming formula is better than ours in the system or in, in, this, in, in this industry. I guarantee it. Do you really think that anybody can give me an objection that I couldn't overcome in the, in the next 10 minutes? And I, I, there's none, because first of all, I'm going to tell them why they're right, lower their fight flight, and then start asking open-ended questions so they overcome their own objections. They'll overcome their own objections. But what is the best way to make sure you never have a no? What is the best way to make sure you never have a no, that you never have an objection? Been harping on it all for, for since you've been on the system, been harping about it for months, I've been harping about it in the last, uh, it's not the 20 point checklist. Nope. What's the, what's the, it's, it's the part of the point. Oh, anticipate their objection. Yeah. Got yeah. So you're all right. I've got a 21 point checklist, anticipate objection. Got what prevents me from having to use got? What prevent, well, that well, doesn't prevent me from getting yeah. Um, I use got to do what? Hey, Tom, got it. Scripts. If you use the scripts, remember when we went through, Two years in a row, we went through every single uh, script. And at the end of that, I would say, listen, would your clients have answered any different way than Jeff answered? Or was Jeff just being nice to me? And you all said no. The clients would have answered the exact same way Jeff answered. Well, there you go. Those scripts will have clients saying exactly what uh, every other client has said over the last 25, 27 years to get them to decide their guy's taking advantage of them and they want to move all their money. And then what you want to do before every meeting is focus, focus, focus. You know, we're in the football season now. We're in the football season now. And um, what I mean by focus is this. Is if, let's say I'm a, a I don't know, I'm a, a, a quarterback. And I've got five daughters. So I'm in a household with a lot of feminine energy. So the way I prepare for Sunday's game is what? I have breakfast with them. I play with my daughters. And then about five minutes before the game, I run in the stadium, put on my pads, and, and go out in the field. Is that, am I prepared for the game? If, that's, if I'm surrounded by feminine energy and I spend all that energy with my daughters, my young daughters, and then go on the field uh, uh, five minutes before the game, am I going to be prepared for the game? I'm going to get what? Run over. I'm going to get killed. Why? So instead, how do football players – Make sure their focus is in the game. They go early. They have breakfast with the team. They go out without pads and throw the ball around. Get ready. Do some drills. Then they go back in. They have a pep talk. Then they get the pads on and go out and do some more. They go back in. Then they get their main pep talk. Then go. And then they get on the field. They're slamming each other in the, in the helmet. And they're slamming each other on the pads. That, they get focused. So how do you do that? Guys, it doesn't even require that much effort from you. What you want to do is just one minute, one minute before your meeting, one minute before your meeting, 
simply say that, you know, you, you get a um, message that Mr. and Mrs. Smith are here, and then you, what you do is say, okay, I'll be out in a minute. And then you center yourself. You take a deep breath, you close your eyes and say, okay, what is the one skill I'm going to concentrate on at this meeting? And now if you're doing your 15 minute drills, this is easy. Why not work on the skill that you were working on that day on your 15 minute drill? You know, I'm not going to ask, I'm not going to make any statements in this meeting. Or I'm going to ask open-ended questions instead of closed-ended questions in this meeting. Or I'm going to make sure I got them this meeting. Or I'm going to make sure I empower them. Not all these guys. You don't want to do all these things. You're going to focus on one of these things. And make sure at this one meeting you're going to do that one skill awesomely. I'm going to make sure it's a, in the first five minutes I empower them for some reason. That's focus. That means you go into that meeting with your mind right. You do that, you're going to be a lot more successful. You don't want to just say, oh, Mr. Smith, Mr. And Mrs. Smith, you're great. I'll be out in a second. Hey, Mr. And Mrs. Smith. That's not focus. And again, just one minute will make your, a focus like that's going to make your meetings go way, 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 way more better. I always be closing. No, no, no. I always be helping. I always be helping. Guys, that's what we do. That's our first seven things in the 20-point checklist is about helping, helping, doing things we do not get paid for. You see how our whole system, every single one of these people who have, who, all these salespeople in HubSpot, HubSpot doesn't know 5Q from Adam. None of these salespeople know 5Q from Adam. So they didn't just say these things because we do them. No. But I'm telling you, the system, all the books I've read, all the psychology that I've done, all the studies and research that I've followed is what I built the system on. And it's what works. That's why these people are top salespeople because they do the exact same thing in their industry. If today you're a little better than you were yesterday, then that's enough. Guys, just get one. That's what the 15 minute drill is about. Get 1% better. If you get 1% better every day, you're going to be three times better by the end of the year. Guys, if you, if your skills were three times better than they were a year from now, would you have any problem if your skills at getting people to move their money to you were three times, 300% better a year from now, would you have any monetary problem? If you were three times better at the scripts a year from now, would you have any monetary program problem? If your marketing was uh, was a little better every single week than it was the week before by you adding one of those no or low cost, would you have any monetary problems with there by the end of the year? Okay, get a, you don't have to do it all at once. And that's like with these with these coaching calls. People say, "Man, Mike, you throw me so many ideas, I don't even know where to start." You start with one thing. That's what you start with. Not all of them. Start with one thing. Get a little bit better every day. And post sale, ensure the customer's happy. What's the thing? When the client leaves the office, they should be there should be a client welcome package in the mail within before the end of day. That should have a thank you gift, whatever that may be, whether it's a blanket or a whatever. And we recommend blankets, but you can do whatever you want for a thank you gift. That letter should be in the mail that day. The letter to their accountant should be in the letter uh, in, uh, that day. So that that thank you for becoming a client should go that that immediately removes or lessens that buyer's remorse when i make a promise we talked about this under promise over deliver don't over uh, under over promise under deliver under promise over deliver live up to what you said you're going to do and follow through guys we have uh, 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 highlighted here a week or two ago we have a process from the time that you market to the time that they become an actual client and then thereafter. One of the main things that I think we do in our follow through is that little flow chart where we show them where their money was with the current advisor and where it's going. And then every single week, every single week I'm calling them, letting them know where that is. Even if it hasn't moved, I'm, and again, it's because these companies are trying to hold on with their fingernails to that money rather than move it to where you, to where you want to move it. You need to call them and let them know. Uh, just so you know, this is where the process is. It hasn't moved yet. We've been in contact with them. It would be helpful if we can get you. I'd be happy to be, uh, be on a joint phone call with you if, we, if you wanted to go faster. Would you want to go faster? Yeah, we can. So don't just uh, spend three weeks waiting for that money to move and you don't contact them. Okay. Does it take sometimes three weeks, four weeks to get that money moved? Yes or no? Does it, when, you, when you move a client's money, does it sometimes take, sometimes does it happen instantly or does it sometimes take two or three weeks? Yes, it does. And guess what that client's doing those three weeks? They don't know where their money is. If they don't know where their money is, whether it's with you, whether it's the other person, or whether it's disappeared, guess what's happening to them emotionally? They're fraught with anxiety. 
The only way you can lessen that is contact, follow through, follow up, let them know what happened and what's happening. Even if nothing is happening, let them know that you know nothing is happening and that you're on it. Like I tell my, uh, anybody that I bought and sold, I think it's nine houses in the last 30 years. And the one thing I tell my real estate agent is, you know what? If you come on with me, here's what I ask. I get a contact every week. I don't care if nothing's happening. I don't care if nobody's looking at the house. You call me up once a week and tell me why nobody looks at the house, what you're doing about it. I, I need contact every single week. If I don't hear from you, guess what I think? You don't care about me. You don't care about selling my house. So if you, are you willing to abide by that? Because if you are, I'm going to hold you to you. If you're not, then I've got to find somebody else. I don't, I don't care if nothing's happening. You still need to call me. And that's the same thing with our clients. Make sense? Be persistent, be patient, be pleasant. This, everything we talked about is all about that. And then you have to explain why now. Here, this is a, from a top salesperson. This is awesome though. And with our system, because do we need to explain to them why they need to do it now? No. Why did they decide they need to move the money now? Do we need to tell them and come up with some artificial reason why they need to move money now? Why do they tell themselves they need to move the money now? Why do they tell themselves they need to move the money now? See, this is great. This is what there's a, the, a tip from top salespeople. You got to tell them how, you know, why they got to do it now. Why do they, why do they need to move the money now? Gosh, you just talked about this not 20 minutes ago. Ah, thanks, Tom. They're disgusted with their current guy. They don't trust their current guy. How long do they want to sit and keep their money with a guy they do not trust? It's not a competition, it's a, door, uh, a doorway, guys. Okay? We're not competing to get uh, um, new clients. We're opening doors. That's what gets us new clients, is we open doors, we don't compete with our competition. And we have to build that trust. We build that trust by never telling, telling, preaching, teaching, we let the client discover for themselves. We never, ever try to pressure people into a sale. And be prepared, I agree with this, and to be prepared in our system is to know the script, focus for that one minute before the meeting. Do your 15-minute drill every day. That's how you get prepared. I'm not asking you to do anything less than what a professional football player does, right? The main rule is to relationship, don't lie, don't cheat, don't make promises you can't keep. We've already talked about this as well. Just a different way to say it. Be nice to people, even those you don't do business with. Guys. What do we do? Let's see if anybody remembers. I don't think I've talked about this for a while. Somebody comes in and they don't have enough money or for some reason you cannot work with them right now. What do you do with them then at the first meeting? See who knows. Who's been a, a student of the system that can answer that question? They come in and whether they don't have enough money or it's all locked up in uh, um, rental real estate or whatever, what do we do with those people? They all, I can't help you. Thanks for coming in. You know, really, really nice meeting you. That no, 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 no. That's not what I do. What do we do with those people? Ah, oh, Mark got it. Awesome job, Mark. A twenty-one light. A twenty-one light. You do the seven non-financial things, and then you do what? The script about hey, just help, just avoid problems, money, hassle. Know anybody else that has that? Blah 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 blah. And they're going to talk about how great you were. You didn't try to sell them anything, but they still left your their. Uh, that first meeting feeling wonderful. That's right, Mark, the referral script. So that's what you do with people you can't work with. At the first meeting, you do a 21 light with them, give them the seven non-financial things and do the referral script at the end. Don't get comfortable with where you're currently doing. Don't get comfortable with your current marketing. Don't get current with comfortable with your current uh, skill level. Don't get comfortable with your current client base. Don't get comfortable. If you get comfortable, guess what happens? Client base erodes, skill level erodes, marketing your roads. You should always be looking at getting a little bit better every day. If we're not a good fit, don't do it. Guys, my, my business ballooned when I got rid of all of my non-retired clients. I, went, I found another advisor. I gave them to the advisor. Didn't even charge them. My deal with the other advisor said, listen, if you, if you churn these accounts, I will meet with all these clients and I will write the letter with them to the state to the state insurance commissioner saying that you and the state security commissioner telling them that you're churning their account. So I'm not charging you so you don't have to churn the account. 
So treat these people decently, take care of them. And then I introduced them. But, but I got rid of all my non-retired clients. So when I looked at retired client now, I said, listen, this is all I do. I can't be an expert in everything. I can't be an expert on college planning. I can't be an expert on how you should handle your 401k while you're working. But there ain't nobody as much of an expert on people who are retired than I am. Because it's the only thing I work with. It's the only uh, um, concerns I have. It's the only laws I follow. It's the only changes in the market that I follow. It's for retired people. I specialize in that. I don't, I don't have clients who are not retired. I don't have them when they're 50. I don't have them when they're 40. I don't have them when they're 30. With the exception of children of my current clients. So if they're not a good fit, I tell them they're not a good fit. So what does that do for me when I tell a retired client? And, I, and guys, this is the guys on the shoot. Somebody came to me with a million dollars and they're 40 years old. I'd say, I can't take you. Because when I look at somebody now and tell them I only work with retired clients, I have to be truthful. Don't, or I find somebody who just does their own stock market work. They're, they think they know everything in the world. Uh, you know, they just want somebody to, to rap with about the market. So is that a good fit for me? No. So what am I going to tell them? I'm not a good fit. You need to know who to turn away as much as uh, uh, who you want. And it has nothing, nothing, nothing to do with how much money they have. Don't tell, tell, preach, or teach. Well, that's really what all of this comes down to. So remember. When you've mastered the scripts and the motive, when you're doing your 15-minute drill and, and are a master at God, that's, forget this one, you do these two things, a year from now, <clears throat> money will not be a problem for you. And the nice thing is, money won't be a problem for you, and guess what will happen to your workload? It will go down, because when you start closing everybody you're in front of, your workflow doesn't go up. It goes down. Make sense? Awesome. So was this a good call? Was this, a, was this a good enforcement and reinforcement on, on why what we do is what we do and, and how to get better at what you do? Awesome. All right. You guys have a wonderful rest of the day, weekend. We will talk to you all next Monday. Thanks, everybody.